Hey guys, it's Dr. Rodriguez, and I am so glad that you all are progressing well in the course. Um, everyone's doing really well. Um, and if you're feeling that you're struggling, just reach out to me, and I am more than willing to work with you and help you bring your grade up. Okay, so let's get into chapter eight, where we are discussing traumatic brain injury or TBI. This is one area that is really sad to me. Um, when you see an individual, and this is really with anyone who has some type of traumatic event, but they are normal, and one second later um, they have a TBI. Um, I've had a lot of experience with this, especially in regard to individuals who are hit by drunk drivers. And as a result, basically being in a vegetative state or a very debilitated state. Um, and so in young people as well. So we'll just get into TBIs and maybe I'll share a story or two. So let's get going. When we talk about a TBI, we're looking at damage to the brain that is a result from external and forceful events, right? So this excludes um, any damage to the brain resulting from a disease, a stroke, or surgery. And then the severity of a TBI can range from a concussion um, that can cause transient amnesia and then changes in consciousness, right, from a mild level to severe level. Um, and it can also lead to coma as well as death. And like I said, I've worked with um, patients who were in a deep coma, um, and you'll see an assessment um, as an example that you would give in a hospital setting um, for a patient in a coma. And then um, we'll just proceed. So typically, when we think of a person who has suffered a TBI, where, you know, you might have a particular demographic in your mind, but it really can affect everyone. But the most common causes of TBIs are falls, motor vehicle accidents, traffic accidents, incidents of a person being struck with an object, like um, a knife or a gun or whatever it might be, sports accidents, right? Think about your football players, any head injury type. Um, I worked with a neurologist who really wasn't a fan of most sports because there is some type of contact that could injure the head, even soccer, um, violent assaults as well. So the most at risk populations include children who are younger than four years of age, um, think about, you know, abuse cases. Individuals older than 75 years of age, think about your falls. I would get so many patients in the hospital having suffered from a fall, right? And they had a head injury as a result. Um, as well as adolescent males. And when we think about our adolescent males, I mean, just consider their mentality at that point, right? They're risk takers. So these are, you know, the ones who are more willing to drive a motorcycle for incident for in, um, instance or to um jump off a waterfall you know and perhaps um like you know i've known different cases where someone like dove into the pool and did like a risky um type of um dive and didn't realize that the water was shallow and then they fell and hit their head um against a rock right and so they had a head injury as a result of that also, male children four years and younger experience the highest rates of TBI. Um, another group is law enforcement and military personnel. They're at great risk for TBI. They're very high risk professions. Think about like explosions, for instance, um, during war, um, IUDs, that type of thing. Um, they are also more um, involved in traffic related accidents, right? So even think about your police officers during chases, right? During car chases, more likely to have an incident of TBI. Now, there are two different types of injuries, right? There's a closed head injury as well as an open head injury. Um, forms of trauma that cause damage to the brain that do not break an individual's skull um, open and it doesn't penetrate the cerebral meninges surrounding the brain are categorized as closed head injuries. Comparatively, we have open head injuries, right? This is when an object penetrates the skull into the brain. And a common cause of this is ballistic trauma. So think of your gunshots. Think about, you know, a projectile 
your shrapnel coming from an explosion um, or from the um, type of bullet it is. And it passes into the brain, you know, across that protective barrier of the skull. Now, there are secondary mechanisms that happen um, as a result of TBI, things that you're looking at. Um, a lot of times, whenever you're reading the case histories of patients, you'll see that they might have increased intracranial pressure. So that's basically a pretty much a pretty major risk following brain damage, right? A lot of times you will find the doctors trying to just decrease that intracranial pressure, right? Because it becomes higher than um, higher than blood pressure, um, the heart rate will have difficulty pushing blood into the brain, and then hypoxia or anoxia, right? So that's the loss of oxygen, right? Less oxygen, hypoxia, anoxia, no oxygen. That's occurring, and then the brain damage, you know, happens, right? Because you're having a death of those of your brain basically at that point and so it has to be treated very quickly so a lot of times that's treated surgically um, for instance by putting a shunt in um, you might have a traumatic hemorrhage right so you're having bleeding as a result of the trauma a hematoma where the blood is gathering outside of a blood vessel um, seizures is another one that you have to look for right that's a common consequence of head injuries as well now, when we look at our children, for instance, right, um, especially our babies, we're looking at shaken baby syndrome, right? And so whenever the baby is shaken back and forth, the brain inside is moving in a forward and a backward position, sharing against the skull, right? And that's causing damage to the brain, right? Your coup and contra coup movement. Um, you have severe physical, visual, and cognitive disabilities as a result for those who survive and they're going to need therapy, right? And some of them will need therapy for the rest of their lives. <clears throat> some symptoms that you look for in shaken baby syndrome is vomiting, difficulty feeding, right? Poor second swallowing, lethargy, altered consciousness, right? They might be comatose irritability, retinal hemorrhages, right? Impaired tracking of their eyes, seizures, lack of smile and vocalizations, difficulty breathing as well. This is also a very sad case to see, especially in the young ones, right? But you have parents, for instance, or an acquaintance um, who becomes irritated, angered by the baby's crying, for instance, and they will shake the baby, trying to get the baby to stop. But the baby doesn't stop crying at that point. It just worsens. I'm sure you've seen many cases on the news. There was one recently where a young mother left her baby with her best friend, who also had a friend um, there at the house. And she was watching the baby for like two weeks. You know, I don't know why the mother left the baby with her for two weeks, but... Um, she did and the friend shook her baby and the baby ended up dying so you see cases like that happen all the time on the news which is very sad when we go back to our military group we're looking at um, modern-day traumatic brain injuries that military personnel most often experience they're not a result of gunshot wounds right that's what I would think but it's because of explosions right and when the bomb blasts, there's like a series of tissue damaging events that can unfold, right? Based on the shrapnel coming from that bomb blast, right? So think of our um, soldiers in the Middle East, you know, um, I think that was like the most recent war <laughs> that we were in, um, where, you know, there are different bombs, right, going off um, that were hidden and whatnot. Whenever we talk about sports related injuries, um, we're looking at athletes being at risk for TBI, right? And really a big spotlight right now and for the past several years is on football players, right? Because they like begin to develop different neurodegenerative disease processes such as Alzheimer's and Parkinson's like conditions, right? But this is known as chronic traumatic encephalopathy or CTE. It's a degenerative disease of the brain caused by repeated head trauma. So think about your football players, even though they have a helmet on, they're taking repeated butting to the head, right? Whenever they're facing off each other during a football game. Think about your soccer players who are head butting the ball 
to, you know, get it to the next person or the next position. Um, and, you know, that one seems less likely, but it happens, right? Sometimes you just need to hit your head in the right place. Um, think about, you know, even your basketball players at times um, or baseball, you know, the ball is coming at them at what, 90, 90, I don't even know <laughs> baseball that much, but 90 miles per hour or whatever um, and beyond. And so you're seeing that. Um, and so for that type of um, traumatic brain injury, it starts to look like someone who has dementia, right? They're confused. There's some memory loss. They have headaches, depression, and excessive aggression within months or years of brain damage. Remember that movie that Will Smith made where he was um, a doctor who dis he was actually the doctor who discovered CTE because football players started coming to him complaining of these symptoms, you know, and they became abusive, you know, towards their spouses um, and so on. And they just didn't feel like they were themselves, but there was no formal diagnosis for them at the time. Well, um, Will Smith's character, and I can't remember the doctor's name, but he was the one who diagnosed CTE and started the ball rolling on that. Different deficits that you see with TBI, we're gonna have your motor deficits, right? Difficulty with riding, with walking. It can go from fine motor to gross motor. Cognitive deficits, which encompasses a wide range of areas, right? Including your attention, your memory, all sorts of things. Altered states of consciousness, right? You can go from the level of a coma to being minimally conscious, right? Um, to fully conscious. Um, personality changes, that's a big one, right? So I even kind of associate this with right hemisphere deficits and seeing some similarities within TBIs, right? So you can even address some of those same areas using the same tools. Language deficits from receptive to expressive, especially your social language, right? Your pragmatic skills can be impacted. Now, when we're assessing an individual who has a head injury, um, depending on what level they are, you know, if they're in a coma, for instance, we're going to use a test like the Glasgow, right? You're looking at their level of arousal you know, by using different sensory inputs. You're looking at their memory, their orientation, their agitation and aggression, right? Their communication, language, cognition skills. And you can use formal and informal assessments um, to ascertain what level of functioning they are at initially. And you're going to be doing an ongoing assessment, right? It's not just like a one-time thing and you're done. This will be a continual process. Now, let's take a look at this video of a doctor um, explaining the Glasgow, right? Today we're going to show you a practical way to perform one of the most important parts of the neurological assessment, the Glasgow Coma Scale. If you want to learn about all things neurosurgery, don't forget to subscribe to the Brain Book channel. The Glasgow Coma Scale was developed in 1974 by Graham Teasdale and Brian Jeanette. Every neurosurgeon will use it to assess a patient's conscious level, whether it's after an acute brain injury or if we're monitoring a patient in the intensive care unit. We've got the awesome CLO here with us today who's going to be our patient, and I'll show you how to do this quickly and easily. When you approach the patient at the bedside, you can get a lot of information about what to expect. If you're in the intensive care unit and the patient is intubated, for example, they may have drugs on board that are going to affect the GCS scale. If you're seeing a patient on a Friday night who's been attacked outside of a bar, they might have a lot of alcohol on board. This is seriously going to affect your examination, so it's really good to know beforehand. The GCS rates a patient's conscious level according to three components what their eyes are seeing, what they're saying, which is the verbal, and what they can do with their muscles, the motor bit. Each of those components is split into separate criteria. There are four for eyes, five for verbal, and six for the motor score. A normal response is the highest or best number, and the lowest is no response. The best score that you can achieve is 15, and the lowest is three, not zero, never zero. Walk to the bedside and introduce yourself. Shout if you need to. Sometimes people might have hearing aids that have run out of batteries, or they've had skull fractures causing damage to their ears. 
Sometimes your patient will already be sitting up with their eyes open, having a cup of tea. If they open their eyes, then that is to sound. You can grab a pen or some kind of blunt instrument and apply pressure to the nail bed, starting slowly and increasing the intensity until they open their eyes or until you've put on enough pressure. You need to do this for at least 10 seconds. Remember, you're not trying to hurt them, but you shouldn't be a soft touch. If they open their eyes to pressure, then you say to pressure. So far, not so bad, right? If they don't open their eyes, it's none. Just remember that if both of their eyes are swollen shut from trauma, or a particularly horrendous wasp attack, for example, then you need to say that the eyes are not testable, or NT. Next, we're going to assess the verbal response. You don't need to go into a full AMTS, but just start talking to them, ask them if they know what their name is, where they are, and what month it is. If they get all of that right, then they're orientated. If they're not orientated and they're speaking in phrases or relatively complete sentences, then you can mark them down as confused. If they're talking gibberish, single words, most often swearing at you, that's words. If they're moaning or groaning and you can't make out what they're saying, then that's sounds. Things are starting to get a bit concerning by this point. If they've got a tube down their throat helping them breathe, it's kind of not testable, so put down NT. When you're testing the motor score, you need to ask your patient to perform a two-step action, either grasping and releasing your fingers or opening a mouth and sticking out their tongue. If they can do that, they are obeying commands. You cannot use the peripheral stimulus alone to test the motor response, so you need to do something called a central stimulus. The first thing that we're going to show you is the trapezius pinch. Here, squeeze for up to 10 seconds and assess what their best response is. If the trapezius is not giving you any response, then you need to go to the supraorbital notch and use your thumb. Again, do this for 10 seconds and get the best response. If they move their arm or hand up above the clavicle towards the stimulus, that's localizing to pain. If the arm bends, and moves rapidly away from the body and the stimulus, that's normal flexion. Abnormal flexion is when the elbow bends slowly and the arm comes across the body. Extension is when the elbows start to extend and that's again a really bad sign. And if they're paralyzed, always put it down as NT. And remember to always make sure that you get the best response. Hopefully you enjoyed that video and you find it really useful. Pop a comment down below if there's anything else that you want to know. Okay guys, so you see how you can give the Glasgow Coma Scale. And this will be very useful for you, especially if you work in an acute care hospital setting or even in acute care rehab setting an LTAP, right? Like a long-term acute care hospital. Um, and this is something I used, um, especially with individuals who were hit by a drunk driver. And I always have two cases in my mind, one being a gentleman who reminded me of my brother um, who was hit by a drunk driver and um, was in a vegetative state fairly for a while, but then he started to come out. Um, but he had locked in syndrome and so he knew everything that was going on however he could not move he's basically a quadriplegic really sad case and another case of a young um, woman who was hit by um, a drunk driver and um, and she was a vegetable um, and basically both of these ended up in nursing homes at their young age so um, that's one um, thing that I'm really um, adamant about or kind of take a platform on is drunk driving. It just ruins people's lives so much. And both of the people who hit them walked away from the car accident and were fine and really didn't get anything but a slap on the hand. So just so you know, <laughs> this is what we're working with. Today we're going to show you a practical way to perform now let's look at an example of therapy right this is another individual who um, 
is has a head injury and you can see he's very severe if you look you can see on the right side with his arm he has some paralysis and that's why his arm is elevated on the pillow and they have him in a chair leaning back right with the head rest because he probably has difficulty with head control and um, things like that so let's take a quick look at this okay let's, let me try this one is your name Raul? Raul, can you look at me again? Thank you. Is your name Raul? Yes. Awesome. Are you 15 years old? Okay, so um, from what we can gather, it looks like Raul, like I said, they are working on some yes-no questions. He was able to respond yes after being asked the second time. You notice that the therapist or the doctor put his hand on his left shoulder where um, he's not paralyzed to get his attention. He asked for his attention again by having him look at the speaker. Um, and then you also see that um, he has what we call a trach in place where he's, yeah, a trach in place. So that's that hole, that opening in his throat area um, for breathing. And he has what we call a passive mirror valve on, which you'll learn more about over time that allows airflow to go through the mouth and out the neck so they can speak verbally. Um, but he wasn't speaking verbally at this point. But these are the types of things that you are going to be working on, but using visual aids as well, right? Answering yes, no questions, depending on how severe the head injury is um, and then like getting like their orientation those types of things the most basic skills you will start working on with patients okay I hope this has been informative and I look forward to seeing you guys later take care